so <laughs> um, a few more words of clarification. Yeah, I used to be, uh, um, I, I am now actually uh, on leave from uh, uh, Sorbonne, which used to be uh, uh, called the University uh, uh, Pierre and Marie Curie. So now Pierre and Marie Curie is only a campus in, in uh, um, uh, of that larger university called Sorbonne, and there are five or six campuses around Paris. So that explains the new logo here. And uh, uh, for th uh, the past two years, I was supported by uh, a foundation in England called the Lever Hume Trust, uh, and which supports uh, uh, science projects and has a, a fellowship program for visiting professors. And that allowed me actually to uh, spend my time at the Institute of Philosophy, uh, uh, which is part of the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. And uh, uh, so it's an inter interesting place. Uh, I encourage you to actually take a look at the website of the uh, uh, Institute of Philosophy. There is a particular center called the Center for the Study of the Senses, and, and uh, which is inside the Institute of Philosophy, where actually, uh, so the, uh, where people meet, it's a uh, really a place where people meet. Uh, 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 weekly, and uh, you also have some permanent researchers uh, and postdocs, and a very well equipped uh, lab. Uh, and, and so, and, and then people meet there to discuss senses in general from uh, the lowest level, uh, like things I do, to cognition and, and social issues. <coughs> uh, and so that's a very uh, good place to be. And, and um, you have specialists of vision and audition uh, sometime, uh, and also of uh, olfaction, which is a very important uh, sense, <coughs> olfaction and, and, and taste. And, uh, and so that's what I, uh, I do there. I have a, f a couple of studies ongoing, still ongoing, uh, 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 which has to do with cognition. I'll give you one example, uh, actually two examples of uh, uh, results that came out, we, have a, um, we made a study which uh, uh, compared the senses in terms of the um, se uh, experience of uh, confidence you have when you make a perceptual judgment. So that's a really fundamental brain function, is to be able to be, um, uh, to, be able to assess uh, whenever you make a decision whether that decision is good or bad. <coughs> So, th uh, so that particular field is called uh, metacognition. It means that actually the brain, obviously, is capable of assessing its own performance. And so, for example, it, it's, it's a very common occurrence when you walk into a room and there is uh, uh, not sufficient light, then actually you would actually automatically put more confidence on your sense of touch. Uh, because you just cannot see. <coughs> and so, and then of course your brain is capable of telling that actually touch is more efficient when there is no light. Uh, and so we uh, studied that phenomenon, uh, uh, um, comparing how uh, uh, the brain would uh, uh, judge tactile performance versus um, uh, visual performance in, in a situation where precisely the um, the judgments are ambiguous. So we managed by an uh, experimental trick uh, to, to uh, achieve a point where actually you would not, you know, you would not be sure which one was, would be the, be the better one. And also the judgment to be made was very hard, just at the limit whether you could actually judge. It was just the length of a, of a, of a stick, essentially. <coughs> and what we found uh, is that actually uh, the performance of uh, the tactile um, experience. Uh, uh, in general, for this very really ambiguous stimuli, at, at right at the threshold of, of uh, discrimination, would be lower than vision. Uh, a good reason for that, because it's, it's actually slower. But people actually put more trust in their tactile judgment. So that was really interesting. It, it, uh, it's, very, it's hard to explain why is it that you would have a uh, sensory channel that would be more trusted when in fact it, it, it would be less efficient. <coughs> so
So that's an interesting result. Uh, it has a historical uh, uh, background. The uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment all believed that actually touch was teaching the other senses. <coughs> it's, uh, um, uh, it's been written by de Condillac and Berkeley and, and Descartes, <coughs> and they all put the sense of touch uh, uh, at the uh, uh, forefront uh, in the uh, sense that it was more reliable. <coughs> uh, and of course, in modern science, we know it's all a matter of, of uh, uh, circumstances and tasks. <coughs> but still, there is this belief and, uh, and which is that the sense of touch is more trustworthy. So that's interesting. It has application, of course, in, uh, in all kinds of domains. It's been observed many times that actually in, in um, marketing studies, uh, that if people can, uh, can touch the uh, object that they um, uh, would like to uh, buy, then they would buy them more. And it's a very good example of that is the Apple Store where you actually <laughs> walk in and you can actually touch the, the uh, goods and, and that makes people uh, uh, believe that actually they work. <laughs> so that's, that's interesting. But there are a lot of many other uh, applications of that result, uh, actually. <coughs> so that's what uh, another um, project that we is ongoing uh, also uh, um, at the Institute is uh, has to do with uh, taste. It's also and taste and olfaction, uh, actually taste itself, uh, 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 quite a bit of, of it is uh, actually um, tactile, or, or what we would say scientifically, it's somatosensory, meaning that uh, um, the uh, uh, neural signals that come from inside the mouth are uh, uh, in part chemical, like from the tongue, but in part mechanical or, 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 or pseudo-mechanical, for example, uh, hot foods, or, or mantle actually drive the somatosensory system. And this is why when you have, you drink uh, uh, a um, uh, uh, dr uh, something that contains mantle, then, then you, it feels cold because you actually drive the uh, cold receptors. <coughs> and, and so that's interesting. And uh, um, that gave us the idea that actually also in perception there is um, uh, uh, class of phenomena which is important to study because it actually tells a lot about the way the brain deals with ambiguity. It's, uh, these studies have to do with um, rivalry, meaning that actually you provide stimuli which are uh, uh, completely um, uh, contradictory. And when rivalry occurs, then your brain actually takes one uh, interpretation and then oscillates between one and the second and, uh, in, in time, okay? So uh, a, a famous example of that is the... Uh, you know the Necker cube? You've all heard of it, I'm sure. I'll try to make one here. <coughs> if you draw a square, you see a square, but you can also make it 3D. And if you also draw the back face, then you create an ambiguous stimulus, which could, be, uh, could represent a square viewed from the front, uh, like this, or it could be a square which is viewed from under. Okay? <coughs> and then once you know that, then you, you're, you will see the two figures. And then if you uh, uh, watch that, actually every eight seconds, then your brain switches from one uh, interpretation to the other. <coughs> it's, pr it's pretty interesting. And then so it happens in, in all modalities. You can create stimuli that are uh, 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 rival. <coughs> and then so we tried to uh, create a stimuli that was rival for taste, uh, hoping that you would uh, have a taste in your mouth that would switch from uh, one quality to the other in time. And uh, uh, so what we did actually is, is actually take um, a, a mixture of mantle that would create a fresh uh, sensation in your mouth and, and then a capsaicin, which creates hotness. So what you have in, in pepper. <coughs> and we made a cocktail, we dosed it. Uh, uh, and, and then we are hoping that actually you, you would have a conflicting 
uh, experience, whether it's cold or hot, it cannot be the two at once. <coughs> and and uh, what happened uh, is that the, the brain resolved the um, conflict, uh, not in time like, like in vision, but in space. So, so what happens when you drink that mixture? You have a uh, um, sensation of a cold object uh, which is surrounded by heat in a, uh, in a sort of a spherical object in your mouth, which is really interesting. It's like it's a new way of, of uh, uh, resolving um, rival uh, uh, stimuli, but in space instead of time. <coughs> uh, and you could probably explain it or uh, give an interpretation to that because taste is a very slow, uh, a very slow sense. It takes a long time to actually the, for the chemical reaction to take place and being uh, processed by your brain. But uh, anyway, so, so that's what I'm doing there. <coughs> and, uh, um, uh, and, also, and I spent half of my time at uh, a small company called Electronica, which was started three years ago. And the basic idea is that uh, you, you all ha uh, have experienced already haptic technologies, like, like things that give you um, uh, 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 tactile feedback. Uh, it's well known in games, the, the Rumble, okay? <coughs> it's, it's also uh, available in most telephones now, and it's particularly nicely done in uh, uh, Apple telephones. You have near very uh, nice clicks and, uh, and buttons. And so the idea of uh, our um, company is actually to um, make this kind of technology available to more companies than big companies. So we actually uh, um, uh, designed a little kit which contains actuators and computers uh, uh, and they, access, uh, they are actually, um, 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 they provide tactile feedback and, and then we uh, um, work with other companies to include it in, in, in their product. So you will never see our product, you will see the results of, of them. <coughs> so that's what we do. And we're actually hiring now, so if uh, uh, you're interested, to come and talk to me. We uh, have a... Uh, How much do you pay me? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why do we have <coughs> um, uh, tactile sensation? Uh, it's a question worth asking. <coughs> uh, there are really two broad uh, reasons why you have... Uh, uh, such sensitive appendages, like hands and feet, and the whole body for that matter. And the, the number one justification or reason why we actually evolved to have such sensitive appendages is to manipulate, is to actually uh, hold objects and then, and then uh, do something with them, use them like tools, or, um, and then so what, or eat. Or, you know, uh, so that's, that's manipulation is almost impossible if you don't have uh, uh, sensitive hands. Walking is completely impossible if you don't have sensitive feet because you're, um, uh, you are unable to assess the quality of the floor on which you walk, whether it's uh, slippery or whether it's uh, soft or whether it's um, uh, uh, granular or whether it's uh, etc. Uh, so there are many studies that show that actually walking, I mean, tactile inputs are essential to walking. <coughs> you can actually uh, uh, notice that uh, sometimes uh, uh, one, um, uh, one of the um, consequences of diabetes is to uh, lose uh, uh, tactile sensitivity and then, and then it's actually noticeable in people from the way they walk in a sort of very uh, slow and, and unstable manner <coughs> because of that. So, so that's, that's one reason why uh, our hands and bodies actually have, and the huge uh, um, uh, brain machinery behind has evolved to, to uh, cater for manipulation. And the second is actually to assess the world, is actually to know what things are uh, which is a little different from uh, 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 um, the manipulative function. It's to actually to, to know the shape, the materials, what things are. And, and the sense of touch is incredibly good at it. 
um, at telling what is the nature of objects that surround us. A good example of that, uh, the, um, there is an entire industry uh, which relies on this fact. It's, it's basically uh, simulated plastics, like, like, like formica and stuff like that. Y you, m you can make simulated wood, uh, and then uh, when you walk into a kitchen or room, you actually think that it's made of wood. But the, within milliseconds, you put your uh, hands on the material, you realize it's made of plastic. <coughs> And so, so the sense of touch is incredibly efficient at uh, 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 identifying what are the materials <coughs> that are uh, being touched. And, and, f and for that, it's really the, the, the king of senses is to, to know if something is made of stone or plastic or wood, <coughs> etc. And also it has a function which is ed hedonistic as we uh, has been uh, um, commented many times. Uh, uh, so there's quite a bit of literature on that, on the hedonic function of touch, of course. Uh, and, um, uh, and also where that uh, picture shows is that it has uh, um, uh, an extraordinary sensitivity. Uh, it's possible, like if you have a, a very small object, uh, like, like smaller than a micron, you can actually detect it uh, tactily very easily. For example, if you have a speck of dust between your two fingers and you run your fingers like this, you immediately realize that there is a very, very small object there. Uh, and uh, um, if you uh, make a measure, uh, lab measurement, you realize that actually with your hand, you can detect vibrations that are uh, in the 100 nanometer range. So it's very, very sensitive. It's a very sensitive uh, uh, sense. It's actually a really good question. Why is it uh, that uh, we evolved to have such an incre uh, incredible sensitivity to vibrations? Um, it doesn't seem to make sense that uh, we evolved it because to detect earthquakes. It's <laughs> uh, it, it has, uh, uh, so I have some ideas that will uh, hopefully uh, um, come up as, as I uh, show examples. Why is it that it's so useful to be able to detect uh, not vibrations themselves, but the nature of vibrations, <coughs> a certain aspect of them. And uh, to give, so this is to give you an idea of um, uh, how, um, yeah, co of course, complicated touches. Uh, <coughs> um, you all know that when you speak put your finger on glass, like, like, uh, like this, and I do this, and I, when I slide my finger on the glass, I have a sensation of what do I feel? I feel glass, and I feel flat. So I have a, a sensation of, of geometry, of flatness, and I have a sensation of material, it's glass. But what is it? what is the message that is picked up by the um, finger and sent to the brain. So we, long time ago, we had this idea that we could actually measure it and then, and then, uh, um, and then uh, uh, develop a, m a means to actually record it and then replay it. So that was the, um, the objective then. It never worked, but it's still a really good idea. <laughs> and I'll show you. What happens when your finger slides on your telephone, you obtain this kind of uh, mechanics, which are really interesting. They uh, arise from the fact that your skin is soft and elastic. Actually, it's soft and viscoelastic. And it uh, uh, has friction against uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, and um, what you're seeing here is the manner in which the skin uh, tr make a transition between sliding and slipping. So that, that's what friction does. It prevents uh, uh, objects in contact from moving. That's what it does. <coughs> it really resists any motion and up to a certain level where actually uh, a slip occurs. Okay. <coughs> so that's, that's what friction does. But in a contact, huh, it does it on the surface. So it's very different from the uh, way of thinking that um, 
uh, you've learned in high school, like, like the Coulomb friction, where you have like two solid objects, uh, which are, uh, um, uh, if you want, uh, some uh, represented by points. But uh, the real physics, there is no point. There is uh, uh, bodies and, and surfaces. <coughs> and, and then uh, what happens is something complicated, like, like you've seen. In fact, uh, I'll play it again because it's interesting. And what it shows that actually the s the, um, in most contact, the, s the skin slips at the periphery before it slips at the middle. And then you have a transitioning dynamics, uh, which is uh, actually uh, uh, quite difficult to model uh, for a simple reason. If you are a bit um, familiar with um, uh, differential equations, <coughs> The problem of uh, the ca this kind of mechanical problem is, is, is a type of problem that is called free boundary, meaning that you the, the boundary which uh, uh, separates the zone which uh, slips from the, the zone that sticks uh, 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 moves all the time. So the boundary condition change. So the solution creates a new boundary, and the new boundary creates a new solution. So it's a free boundary problem, uh, which is of the worst kind <coughs> possible. Uh, and it has uh, many uh, interesting properties, of course, but the information that is reaches your uh, um, experience is still very something quite simple. It's glass and flat, and and so what is in between this uh, uh, signal? Which is so see each time you see a little white dot here, it's a sweat pour in your finger, and then you can imagine that around uh, each sweat pore you have like uh, about four mechanoreceptors huh? and uh, of, of the type that respond to um, uh, transients. And, and then you have about one uh, uh, mechanoreceptor that re uh, responds to sort of steady, uh, steady stimulation. <coughs> and so each time you, you do this, then you have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, neural activity in your fingertip, which is uh, set up the um, pathway and then eventually becomes glass and uh, uh, shape. And when Tony actually organized a, a wonderful conference a couple of years ago, uh, uh, that was at the, at the Kavli Center, <coughs> where um, he had the, uh, <coughs> Tony had the gracefulness of inviting me and, and uh, think about theoretical ideas. And that's actually uh, this idea. Uh, I think it has been very useful for me. Maybe it'll be useful for you. It's, it's about uh, 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 trying to uh, see what is exactly your sense are doing. <coughs> so in the uh, realm of vision, uh, it, of course, has been a problem uh, for a long time since uh, uh, Helmholtz and, and many scientists are trying to decide what is it that your uh, sense of vision is doing. And in the more modern ways, actually, uh, it's, it's been sort of um, uh, quite well understood how the natural vision really uh, seems to work. Although, of course, it's still a completely open problem, but, but there's quite a nice theory about it. And it starts from a simple idea, is that the uh, light field in which you live, like this one, actually is uh, contrary to your, your intuition. It's not a uh, three-dimensional space like, like the physical space. Uh, of, uh, it is actually a seven-dimensional space. And that's pretty easy to uh, 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 figure out, actually. If you take every photon that is traveling in this room, then it's basically is tracing a ray, so uh, uh, a straight line. <coughs> and that straight line is parameterized by f uh, uh, five numbers. You need a point in which it goes through plus two angle for the orientation mix, five numbers. So every photon is parameterized by five numbers plus a color plus uh, um, uh, uh, a time varying component. <coughs> so it the f uh, everything that's to be seen in a room has seven dimensions. And what, what the eyes do, they uh, reduce the number of dimensions. And uh, using optics, uh, you actually project uh, 
this light field uh, uh, on, the, on the surface, like in the camera, and then you make it 2D. So you actually make a reduction of, uh, of dimension. <coughs> and if you have a camera, then you have 3D. <coughs> And uh, so, and then, uh, uh, so the visual system does something a bit like that. Clearly, it it really reduces the number of dimension, quite differently from a camera, but it it, it does it uh, 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 nonetheless. And then uses and also has um, um, uh, so the retina is not is not an imager like 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 a camera. It's actually a computer. And what what the retina does it. At the very beginning, w the very first uh, uh, neural uh, layers of the retina actually produce even more dimensional reductions <coughs> right at the beginning so or to make the whole uh, uh, process of vision possible. <coughs> so that's, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, Adelson talked about it, uh, uh, Condorink, and m uh, many s uh, scientists really discussed this idea of dimensional reduction in vision in a very a beautiful way. But the question is, can you discuss that in the same manner for touch? Is it possible to describe uh, in a um, sort of systematic manner how the number of dimension is reduced so you can actually have sensations and not just a mess? <coughs> and, and so uh, the answer is n um, it's not really do uh, doable, I think, at this point, and I explain why. Uh, essentially, the act of touching uh, is, is making two bodies interact. That's what uh, uh, happens <coughs> in a mechanical sense. And, and uh, uh, so, for example, you have a body A and a body B. B would be the sensor or the perceiver. And then A is, is uh, you know, on the floor or my telephone or another person. And, and uh, basically what happens is when the two bodies interact, uh, they both change shape, that's mechanics, <coughs> uh, uh, at the moment of contact. And, and then the job of the perceiver B is to guess something useful about A from its own change of shape. So that's what, it, well, that's what the problem is. <coughs> uh, uh, so that's, that's uh, intriguing. So you can go back to continuum mechanics to uh, 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 try to get a hand, uh, handle on the problem. I don't know uh, if you have an engineering background. Do you? Then you may remember uh, continuum mechanics courses. They are horrible. <laughs> they have like, uh, you know, like uh, fluid mechanics and solid mechanics. <coughs> anyway, that's where the stuff is, actually. <coughs> And, uh, but there the is uh, the a little problem uh, is in the title, it's continuum. So really the uh, shape of bodies uh, and how they uh, evolve through time is a continuum, meaning that uh, uh, you have to have an infinite number of dimensions to be able to talk about it. So you, uh, if it, you have a liquid, then you have the uh, <coughs> uh, Navier-Stokes equation, and if you have a, a solid, then you have uh, a, you know, the solid equations, and so on. And that's where actually what happens whenever you, you walk and touch and, and manipulate. <coughs> so it's, uh, it's clearly uh, not simple to invert it, you know, to actually uh, uh, learn something about A from something about B. <coughs> but uh, it, it can be done, of course. And um, for example, people doing virtual reality, not even thinking about these questions, they do it naturally. <coughs> and they uh, uh, will assume that, for example, um, the interaction can be s uh, um, uh, summarized by a single number. <coughs> that could be uh, one way, you know, instead of having an infinite number of numbers, then you have just one, <coughs> a scalar, okay? And so that's possible to do. Uh, for example, the scalar could be a function of how much you indent. So that's, that's a, 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 a highly simplified version of the real world, but it, it, can, it can be uh, you justified in certain cases. And in fact, the local deformation assumption is not so uh, bad 
because it corresponds to a very important uh, principle in mechanics called the Saint-Venant principle. It's and what it says that actually if you deform bodies, solid bodies, uh, uh, at one place, then the uh, consequences of the deformation vanish very quickly. So that's important. Like for example, if you take a, uh, a, a bar and then you put it in a vice in, in a workshop and you squeeze the bar with your vice, then you will make a dent in the bar and it will be local, there will be no consequence uh, 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 far away. Okay, <coughs> so that's called the Savenon principle. That's essentially how you build machines. Uh, and and uh, uh, it has exceptions, of course. Uh, for example, a sheet of paper is an, excep an ex exception. You can take a sheet of paper and bend it, uh, and then you can have a local interaction and then a far away consequence. <coughs> uh, so, so that's why it's a principle, it's not a more than that. But for touching is very important. It means that when I put my finger on the blackboard here, then I can make the assumption that actually there is only consequences at the near the contact. <coughs> so that's, that's a very useful um, uh, way, which actually turns out to be wrong, uh, uh, as I will show later. So it, it really makes this uh, notion of uh, assumptions very important to make sure what is, uh, is assumed and what is assumed is not always true. <coughs> For example, you have examples like that. Other, uh, you can have um, uh, special cases like a rigid object and a rigid probe. So, so the first case is what you have uh, when you go to the uh, mechanical shop and you take a caliper and you measure the size of an object in a caliper, and then you have uh, you learn something about the object from the uh, 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 state of the caliper, assuming that there is no deformation. <coughs> so they are both rigid, and that's how you can tell that you know the, an object has a certain size. But if if they are one of them is soft, it no longer is true. Actually, if you go take a piece of rubber and try to measure it. You don't have its size, you don't really know, actually. <coughs> so, um, uh, so you can have rigid object and soft probe, like, like what happens a lot in, in everyday life. You have soft fingers, huh? but the object that you touch often are uh, more rigid than the finger. And I'll, if we have time, I'll give examples on how that can be um, uh, worked out, <coughs> and so on. Uh, and uh, 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 the last point is really crucial to have an idea about how um, touch operates, uh, is that um, um, you have to think of it always in uh, nonlinear terms. So there's always effects that are nonlinear in mechanics, and that's what makes it so rich and interesting. Here is an example where, say, a doctor goes and, and the palpation and tries to find out if you have a lump. Okay, so that's something you do uh, by touch. And then you will notice that the doctor actually is moving the finger around the lump. And they'll say, oh, yes, yeah, you're real sick. Okay, <coughs> and uh, like here, for example. And so why do you move? It's because essentially you create a mechanical phenomenon called buckling which makes actually the state of uh, 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 the mechanical state depend on the trajectory. So, so it's exemplified here. You have an initial contact here, you push down first, and then the lump goes on the side, it's pushed on the side. And then you keep pushing and it's more on the side. So if this uh, finger is sensitive, then it will uh, find that actually the lump is on this side, on the, on the, le on the right side. Now you have a second gesture, the different strategy. F before pushing down, you push sideways, and then the lump flips on the other side, so you buckle. <coughs> and then when you push down, it ends up in a different state. So you have uh, 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 identical initial states, different trajectories, and different final states. And, and that alone is sufficient to tell that actually there is a, a, a rigid object embedded in soft tissues. <coughs> And so that's, that's a very interesting strategy which comes from the um, 
properties of mechanics. <coughs> And there are many like this, and uh, many, of, of course, arise uh, from friction, which is the m most nonlinear thing you can ever think of, and makes really life possible. And of course, because the problem of, uh, that your um, brain is solving in f uh, touching objects uh, is so ill-defined and complicated that there are many illusions that can be uh, elicited in, in the tactile domain. That's the one that's shown here is, uh, uh, was described by Aristotle a long time ago. And it, it, uh, uh, you can actually do it when you cross your fingers like this, like on the picture here. And then you go and, and touch an object uh, which is round. Uh, and then uh, if you don't look at it, then you will actually feel two objects. Uh, and the reason for that, after, of course, it can be ex you can talk about it a long time. It's interesting. Yeah. <coughs> so you, feel you have two telephones now. <laughs> and it's essentially it's because your brain is solving this uh, 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 perceptual problem from your uh, mobile hands. And they are really mobile. But they are not mobile in an infinite number of ways. They are uh, always adopting these grasping uh, uh, postures. So you never go and, and eat uh, with your fingers like this. You, you know, you, you most often uh, uh, use your fingers in, in a natural manner. So basically, the, uh, this particular configuration is, ne is not taken into account by, by uh, the processes. <coughs> and, uh, and then so the resolution for it is having two objects uh, instead of one. It, it works the other way also. It's pretty nice. You cross your fingers and you find a corner of a room and you touch the two walls on, on the sides and then, and then the walls become flat. <coughs> it, it works. Uh <coughs> so that's, that gives... Um, uh, we don't have much... I'll, uh, yeah. A, a lot of... So illusions can fall into all kind of different categories. And so... Um, um, so as my first movie was trying to show, I mean, the uh, um, number of ambiguities is enormous. Okay. So here is a very simple case of, of, of uh, mechanics where the ambiguity is made more clear. Okay. <coughs> you take a comb like this one, uh, and then you touch the comb with your finger. And then if the s bristles of the comb are close enough, uh, then you feel like a line. You I mean, you, c you don't really feel the bristles anymore when they are at 1.2 millimeter apart, and then you feel a line. And what you do, you uh, arrange for a small um, contraption to push bristles apart locally. So what that does actually is create a displacement in one direction and the other direction. And, and then, uh, so essentially, the gray line here uh, shows the displacement. And in one simple computational um, simplification of uh, uh, what the transduction process is actually that you, what you feel is actually the gradient of the displacement. So, it's, uh, so essentially, the gradient of the displacement is the strain, is how much your uh, tissue has been strained. Okay? So the strain is the first derivative, so it gives you a, uh, a, a function like this one. And it turns out from the contact mechanics that this particular strain is the same uh, one that would be given if you have a punch pushing inside your finger. Okay. <coughs> uh, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, and you do feel a punch, actually. Uh, but the um, uh, strain field has been rotated by uh, uh, sort of 90 degrees. <coughs> so instead of being, when you punch inside the finger, then you would have a, a principal direction which is normal, and here the principal direction is lateral. But if the, uh, you make the assumption that the mechanoreceptors are not sensitive to orientation, then the signal is the same, and actually the sensation is really met very much the same uh, if you have a, that particular uh, contraption um, well designed. <coughs> so that's uh, 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 one source of tactile lesions is basi the basic law of mechanics. 
just like for optical illusions, the basic laws of, of optics can give rise to certain uh, class of illusion. <coughs> Another one here. Yeah. When you're saying that you feel uh, a sensation, like how do you measure this? Is it self-report? Uh, it could be self-report. If, um, if you do a... Uh, so, in, yeah, it's an interesting question, actually. <laughs> Self-report is the best, uh, but often uh, when you write papers about illusions, the reviewers don't uh, believe you, yeah. and especially when it comes to uh, tactile illusions. So I've been struggling with that problem for uh, a quarter century, <laughs> essentially, and uh, the best uh, way to go about it is to uh, create a perceptual task, like uh, how big or how uh, uh, wide, something like that. And then you have a real stimulus. And then you have a fake, I mean, an illusory stimulus. And, and then you essentially create a, um, a perceptual equivalent function by, uh, uh, in a parameterized manner. So that, that actually is a pretty convincing uh, uh, method. And, and uh, even more convincing, uh, is when you can blend a real stimulus with an uh, illusory stimulus and show that they actually combine, say, uh, 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 using a simple law like, like, like additive. And uh, in that case, then it's even more convincing because then the brain doesn't take two different signals. It's really used them as one. <coughs> so that's the only two methods I've found so far. And the other way? This one? Well, this one, uh, um, is, as I said, it was discovered in 1886, if I rec uh, recall. The original paper is, there's no, it's just uh, um, self-report. <coughs> it's really fun to read, actually. And, um, and uh, since then, there have been literally hundreds of papers uh, on it, either using scaling methods or uh, uh, perceptual equivalent methods. Uh, recently, I had a study on, uh, related to this illusion using a technique called the single stimulus. So instead of having, comp uh, instead of comparing uh, uh, two stimuli, you actually, like for example, uh, then you have a series of, of stimuli that vary parametrically in a random manner, and you compare your sensation to an internal standard. And that's a very, it's actually an excellent method. It's, it's become very popular now. It's faster, it has less biases than uh, 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 a standard comparison type uh, or, or, well, they each of these methods have different advantages and drawbacks depending on what you'd want to do uh, and what you can also uh, um, within the time and the statistics you want to obtain. Yes, yeah, yeah, neural collates, of course, yeah. So like yeah. Faster. If you, if actually, uh, uh, the one I'm showing here, it, it, it's been uh, um, tested on, uh, it's never been published, but there was a short study uh, on uh, using um, a neural collate called, method called the uh, uh, transmagnetic stimulation. So you actually um, attenuate the activity in a region of the brain. And, and uh, actually, this particular sh uh, shape sensation I was about to talk about can be uh, abolished by, uh, uh, I think, if I recall, we never finished it, but I recall it was uh, uh, stimu uh, destimulating S2. Like, it's, it's a particular area of the somatosensory cortex, <coughs> which shows that actually it was really a shape. <coughs> Because that would be, you would have the same uh, uh, ab abolishment if you have the real shape. <coughs> so, so yeah, this one uh, is interesting. It's uh, <coughs> essentially the um, uh, uh, belief is that when you put your hands on an object, uh, the shape of the object is uh, perceived through the position of your fingers. Uh, and, um, but in fact, there's a lot more information available to your fingers when you hold an object than, than just where they are in space. And what we show that actually the most reliable information is not the position of the fingers, 
It is actually the um, perceived normal of the object, so independently from its position. <coughs> and so, so that's interesting. Um, we, uh, it, was, it was known from uh, um, actually a long time ago through uh, um, st static cases. <coughs> But uh, we have here a um, uh, dynamic, you know, it's more, more precisely speaking, it's a, a kinetic uh, version. <coughs> and so, so this particular machine I just showed allowed us actually to dissociate the information coming from finger movement from where the normal would be estimated at the contact. And uh, what you get, Actually, you can actually uh, um, uh, make a graph, huh? which actually, uh, okay, so what, what this comes from is the fact that uh, every sensory problem has an aperture problem, meaning when you uh, uh, obtain information through your eyes, ears, or fingers, uh, or mouth, uh, then you have uh, only a small window on the world. For example, when you look, you only see a very small foveal uh, region uh, sharply. And so, so you have an aperture problem. It's like looking through a little hole, if you want. <coughs> so you have to guess the rest. And so fingers are like this. They have an aperture problem. When you uh, put your finger on the surface, you get uh, information from a centimeter square. That's all. <coughs> and, and then so you have to guess the rest. So that's why you move your hands. And, uh, and then the question is, what is the information that's the most useful? Okay. And then the way you can reason about it, it's uh, by orders. So zero order would be uh, um, like positional information about an object. First order would be the slope. Second order would be curvature. <coughs> and, and so on. And uh, using different studies, including our own, we could make sort of a space of all apertures it's actually fairly easy to uh, figure why. If you have a fi uh, finite aperture and then you have a certain shape, then you can actually, uh, uh, you could have, you can um, know its curvature or, or its, its um, uh, slope for it. <coughs> and then you can see which one is the most reliable in the um, uh, presence of noise, of, of uncertain uh, uh, information. And then you find out, actually, it's pretty nice for all apertures that are uh, of the centimeter uh, uh, scale, then the curvature is the most reliable uh, information, which is what hap happens when I squeeze the chalk here. I really feel the curvature directly. <coughs> and that's what my brain uses, actually. But if it's a little bigger, between one centimeter and uh, uh, say a meter, then the slope is more reliable. <coughs> and so, uh, and if it's even big, uh, bigger than uh, its position. So if you hug a big tree or an elephant, <laughs> then, <laughs> which is, <laughs> then it's, it's the position, <laughs> position that matters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, and as far as I can tell, this particular graph here is the only <coughs> quantitative uh, sort of model of uh, uh, haptic perception that I was ever published. All the others are um, um, sort of uh, qualitative or single, uh, small cases, but here we have a model that spans a big space, so it's a, very, it's a nice uh, thing to remember, and it's very useful, of course, when you design um, uh, haptic interfaces to have this uh, knowledge in, in uh <coughs> I'll skip that. <coughs> uh, yeah, <coughs> so that's an interesting um, consequence also of the um, manner in which a machine or an animal can resolve ambiguity is actually to have uh, uh, prior assumptions and prior knowledge about what is being touched. <coughs> And of course, the laws of uh, mechanics, of physics, are invariant knowledge. They are always true. 
you can count on them, like gravity, like uh, um, uh, uh, vibrations. Actually, in mechanical domain, the modes of vibrations are really essentially uh, uh, things that you can rely on. Okay. <coughs> And, and in here, uh, there is a class of material that's, uh, which is important to us. They are not liquids, they're not solids, they're in between. Uh, and this class of material is uh, uh, called granular, like sand and earth, uh, or even a piece of wood can be seen as granular. It's made of fibers, which, uh, uh, in, which is when you bend it and you crack it, it doesn't uh, uh, behave like, like a piece of uh, plastic. It, it cracks by little jumps, okay? <coughs> and so the granular uh, or uh, fibrous um, class of material is really important to us. And it's really actually so important that most of things on the planet are like this. There's very little um, uh, uh, engineering materials. <coughs> There's mostly sand and uh, uh, wood and, f and uh, leaves you know, things that are made of, of, of uh, little pieces <laughs> that are interacting. And uh, so we'll get to that. Actually, all these materials share an important property that will come uh, obvious in a minute. But first, here we uh, uh, created that experimental condition. We have a, uh, a display here, <coughs> and it is made of many little uh, tractors, uh, uh, moving uh, uh, places. Huh? And then we can uh, move them uh, in synchrony or individually. We can do a lot of different uh, uh, stimuli with them. And of course, they engender uh, stimuli in your fingers that you can feel. And then we have uh, this experimental condition where they all moved in phase here, boom, boom, like this. Uh, in the second uh, condition, they'll move out of phase. So every uh, neighbor would move uh, uh, in uh, counter phase uh, with, uh, with each other. And you can actually work out from a, a mechanical and a neural perspective that in uh, the in phase provides a, 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 a hundredfold less mechanical stimulation than the e anti phase. It's normal because you have very little strain. Okay? Whereas here you're actually uh, generating maximal strain. <coughs> So, uh, and then we've actually verified in the lab that it creates tremendous uh, neural activity. <coughs> uh, the stimulus is uh, a little funny. The way it works is that um, you push on the surface and the um, slope, I mean, the rate of uh, 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 load increase determines the frequency. Okay, so if I uh, don't, if I push steady, I get no stimulation. If I push fast, I get more. Okay, <coughs> and you can uh, so you get this kind of uh, if you, this belt shape here is also very stereotypical. It's one of these tremendously robust invariants in motor behavior, uh, which is the one that you. Uh, this one is when you uh, co come in contact with the surface, and then you you have these motor programs that are really strong and make you work, uh, uh, behave always the same way. <coughs> and, and then pushing is one of them. You always get a very nicely timed uh, bell-shaped uh, curve when you ask people to push on the surface, <coughs> which is very useful for Apple to make good clicks, <laughs> actually. <coughs> uh, but that aside, um, here, you, uh, essentially, the deflection of each of these little uh, surfaces is a, a essentially a periodic function of the load. Okay, so um, so you have a periodic function of the load, meaning that if the argument varies fast, then you have more oscillations. <coughs> and what happens is like be, um, uh, phenomenologically, when you actually push on this particular case here, you feel your finger moving through the surface, but not by a small amount, by like many millimeters. So it's like as if your finger is going through 
the surface. It, as if it was completely soft, but you have really this sensation of movement in your finger <coughs> when actually the surface is rigid. And in the second case, which actually creates a lot more stimulation, you, have, you feel a, a perfect rigidity, perfect immobility. So that's uh, how do you explain that? Uh, it's, uh, so that's the results, of course. You get a very nice uh, relationship between the rates and the uh, amplitudes for most people. And then uh, for the antiphase control case, then you have absolutely no sensation of um, displacement. <coughs> so the way it's, we explained it, it's uh, again going back to the granular materials. The granular materials, that's what they do. They um, when you compress sand or uh, coffee beans or uh, wood, actually, it's the same, the number of mechanical events per unit of time is, um, is uh, proportional to the rate. Okay, so that's, and uh, it comes basically from uh, conservation of energy. <coughs> and that's the way you dissipate the energy acoustically and, and, and mechanically. <coughs> And so you can actually verify it. If you put a, a, a bag full of uh, beads on the fourth sensor and you push on it, you get, you know, you get this uh, response. And you get actually, from a statistical viewpoint, the same profile for with our um, in-phase stimulus, but not for the anti-phase. <coughs> and, and so you will say, but this is weird, because you are talking here about um, uh, statistical recording, where in fact your stimulus was uh, perfectly um, uh, uh, deterministic. It's just a sine function. <coughs> but it's not counting, uh, it's discounting a very important fact in, uh, in somato sensation and, and, and motor behavior that actually whenever you move, you, there's always, um, uh, you never move exactly the same way and you have uh, uh, quite a bit of noise in your motor system and also quite a bit of noise in your uh, sensory system, which actually means that the uh, uh, deterministic stimulus is actually never the same. <coughs> and so the stochasticity that you, uh, we recorded here is actually due to the fact that you never really move and you have a bit of tremor also and so on. There's a lot of uh, um, non-deterministic uh, components. <coughs> We, replic we uh, replicated the similar study here with uh, using uh, still the same way of thinking uh, <coughs> uh, with uh, colleagues at, the, um, uh, uh, at that time that was in um, uh <coughs> colleagues in um, Pisa. Now essentially observing that whenever you touch an object, then the contact that you make with the object depends on how much you push. So if I you know if I push uh, make a small contact and push more, I get a bigger contact, and and so and normally when you push on things, your brain assumes that um, the uh, surface that you are pushing on doesn't move. It's very important. <coughs> so uh, uh, and it's an assumption, actually. Uh, if you realize it, I think of an animal or even a robot pushing on a, a concrete wall, then uh, uh, almost every sensor in your body or in the robot's body will give you a signal, which is uh, uh, related to the load that you are applying <laughs> and through the feet and through the hands and the skin, everything responds. But if, if the wall is a little elastic, uh, you have the sensation of elasticity but basically, the uh, neural response is, this, is basically the same because you, you're loading. So where, how on earth can you tell that something's moving from something that's not moving? <coughs> and and uh, uh, so the idea behind these two experiments is actually that you, uh, the brain is making an assumption about the nature of what you touch. And that's what uh, determines the sensation of your own state. So it's, it's the knowledge of the external world that tell you where, where, what is the state of your own body. It's not, nece it's not necessarily a sensory experience. 
it's really an inference based on, on what uh, 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 your brain assumes the world is made. <coughs> and then here, we just m uh, uh, violate that assumption with that uh, apparatus here. What it does is it actually changes the uh, nature of the contact as you push. And, and then it gives you the sensation of moving your finger when actually it's not moving. <coughs> Simp simply because that relationship is, is, uh, is uh, reproduced. <coughs> oh, yes, I wanted to speak about mechanics again because it's uh, really um, um, sort of fundamentally important to touch the way uh, mechanics work. And I mentioned friction was important, clearly. And here, that's uh, and friction actually, uh, counterintuitively, is very much driven by the presence of water. So, um, uh, because our our skin is a biological tissue, it's always wet. It has to be, because it's it's uh, uh, alive, and the wetness makes it. Uh, give it frictional properties that are uh, uh, quite unique, very different from wood or metal or plastic. <coughs> and um, uh, so we uh, realized that in that uh, uh, earlier study here, by um, noticing that actually the uh, gripping behavior was uh, very uh, dependent on, on, on humidity. And the uh, observation is that if you have dry hands, then you tend to squeeze more for the same object. Okay. <coughs> so, so that's been verified many times. Uh, but the question is why? So the uh, easy answer is that actually the uh, skin is more slippery when it's dry. <coughs> and it's true uh, to a certain extent. But what is more interesting, actually, is uh, shown on that graph here, is actually you can, uh, on, on the uh, abscissa here, um, you have how much you load a, a contact. And the ordinate, uh, you have the ratio of the part that, the uh, skin that's slipping to the part of the skin that's not sticking. So you could have the stick ratio. So when it's one, you have a good lift. When it's zero, it's finished. And you have everything in between. <coughs> okay? and, then, and then what is interesting is that the uh, moisture in your skin changes the slope. And that's really interesting because it means that why is it, it probably, it suggests that actually you squeeze more when you have dry hands. It's not because you have get more friction is because you give your brain the option of anticipating more. Because the distance from a, a, a good grip to catastrophe is smaller when it's dry. So, so essentially what your uh, brain has learned to do is to increase that distance for safety. So what you are seeing here, so uh, there is a, a well-known um, uh, technique to measure something in, 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 uh, in mechanics, it's called the true contact. So when you have two uh, uh, objects that are um, coming in close contact, touching actually, you have the uh, intuition that they create a surface. We talked about the surface many times. But in reality, that surface can be very, very small. Like if, uh, 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 really at atomic scale. And, and so uh, um, your um, body is covered by a material called keratin, which is the same as your hair, but it's uh, uh, the outer layer of the skin. And the keratin, at least the uh, type that makes your um, uh, outer skin, has a... Uh, uh, um, Mostly, uh, it actually uh, has, so keratin comes either in a crystal state uh, or in an amorphous state. And when it's dry, essentially, it, it, it is in a crystal state and it's incredibly strong. But it, when it becomes wet, uh, 
it becomes uh, much more elastic and it becomes plastic. And uh, uh, in mechanical terms, the young modulus actually increases or changes by a factor 100, even a thousand. So it's a tremendous uh, a mechanical change according to the level of uh, uh, moisture in your skin. And the result is if you have a dry finger that touches a piece of glass and you measure the true contact, so really uh, where the uh, surfaces interact at atomic scale, like they're close enough actually to create frictional uh, forces, then the true contact is uh, very small. And I'll show you actually it's so small that you can see it evolving through time if you keep keeping uh, keep your finger on the surface uh, and it takes a good 10 seconds if not 20 seconds actually for the um, uh, keratin to trap the water that is present inside your uh, finger between the glass and the uh, uh, and the finger and then create a sufficient amount of, of uh, moisture that will make the keratin become plastic. And it takes a long time, it takes 10 seconds, uh, you, uh, uh, and you can wait more actually. It, it'll saturate eventually, at 60 seconds it saturates. And it's really amazing because this um, uh, something you've never realized in your life, that actually when you hold a surface which is smooth, impermeable and atomically flat, which is uh, uh, the case of a glass or a plastic cup, then the friction takes a long time to uh, uh, ev evolve. It takes essentially 20 seconds before you have a good grip. And, and uh, uh, so there are so many mechanical phenomena that are taking place uh, uh, without you realizing uh, that is really poses question about uh, uh, how is it possible that actually your uh, somatosensory s system can function in these uh, conditions of, of extreme variability. Uh, so that uh, picture can be supported by uh, uh, essentially uh, graphs. So you can see that actually when you are holding uh, an object, then the gross surface, the one you imagine is immediately uh, created as soon as you grip, as the node increase, but actually the um, uh <coughs> true contact takes a long time to, to become established. And what is uh, more interesting is that if you touch uh, something else than glass, then say plastic or, or this paper here or this fabric, then each time you get a different evolution, of course, because the um, uh, behavior of water depends on the counter surface. If you have something porous, then the water is actually uh, evacuated and the friction actually takes even more time to, to be uh, created. If you have a surface that is rough, but then when I mean rough, maybe a, a, a few microns of, of uh, uh, roughness, then you have a completely different evolution also, because these are things that happen at atomic level. <coughs> and that's really interesting because it really shows how actually um, uh, this dynamics gives you information, I mean, seems to be given all the information that is necessary to identify materials, like what I mentioned at the beginning. Like, like you know, the glass or the stone or the wood, <coughs> it really has to do with uh, uh, this domain of tribology, which studies the dynamics of how uh, friction evolves <coughs> through time and through uh, all kind of other factors. So that's why we uh, uh, um, call the paper rubber. No, why is it like you put? You like to have paper with uh, rubber grips? Huh? It's because the rubber, at the moment of contact, uh, is a lot more soft than the keratin. The keratin looks like the Alps, you know, it has, uh, uh, or the Pyrenees. <laughs> it has like points and it's very, very uh, uh, complicated. But if, if it's pushed against a soft material, then, then the 
contact is made immediately. <laughs> so it, it's, not, it's not the finger, it's the material that makes the contact. So that's the point um, that makes uh, rubbery grip feel secure. <laughs>